Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Foursquare Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging onto our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. excited about next Saturday, and I encourage each and every one of you, um, if you're interested or would like to do that, I think it's going to be a great time. But I do have, well also, if you do not have a handout, please raise your hand. It has all the scriptures that we're going to be going over, and I can actually tell you today, it's going to have some of the scriptures, it actually has a lot of scriptures that I'm not going to be going over, so, um, but they are scriptures that God put on my heart. If you have your Bible, if you want to open up to Daniel chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 14, so there's a, a little... Verses 14 through 18, we went over last week, and we're going to go over them again, and then we're going to finish up the rest of Daniel chapter 3 today. And then finally, the last announcement I have, after service, if you guys uh, would please join us, we are finally going to be celebrating Josh and Allison's wedding. Uh, it was only like five months ago. I'm just kidding. But we have a cake for them, so if you want to just hang out and have a piece of cake, um, and just, you know, encourage them and, and talk with them and laugh with them. Um, I would ask that you do that. But I do have two questions for you. Did you bring your Bibles today? Yes. Come on, people, wake up. Did you bring your Bibles today? Yes. If you do not have a Bible, please raise your hand and we will get you one. And if you do not own a Bible, please accept it as a gift from us to you. But more importantly, did you come expecting great things from a great God today? Yes. Did you come expecting God today? Yes. See, here's what I think. I think God gauges the volume. And if like if you're soft, he's like, ah, gonna... so you gotta yell. You gotta yell. So I'm just kidding with that. But we are continuing our study on the miracles that God performed in the Old Testament to understand the impact that miracles can have on us. You know what? I was talking to someone this week, and you know, as, as Christians, how often, and I'm, I'm being serious for a minute, how often do we forget that there's a whole book before the New Testament? I, I call them, we have a lot of, you know, I used to be, we're a lot of New Testament Christians. We love the New Testament, but we forget that there's a whole other book in front of that, the Old Testament. And, and I just love the Old Testament because there are so many amazing stories that, that, that fill those chapters and, and can be such an encouragement for us. And so I encourage you, as you do your daily reading, if you do not spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, I encourage you to do so. It's just some, it's just some amazing uh, books. It's amazing scripture, and I know that it will change your life. But but isn't it incredible how many miracles are included in the Bible? There are hundreds of miracles that are listed in both the Old and New Testament. From small to large, each tells of God's great power, His presence, and His mercy. And see, I personally don't believe that miracles should be measured by the magnitude i.e. like we read a couple of weeks ago, partying in the Red Seas or bringing water from a rock. But I think that we should measure miracles based upon the impact that they make to people around us. Some miracles will bless thousands, like when Jesus fed the 5,000. And some miracles will only be noticed by one, like Balaam and his donkey. But regardless of the size of the miracle, I think it's safe to say that miracles never go unnoticed. Back in 2000, Newsweek took a poll concerning the topic of miracles, and here are some of the results. 84% believe that God does perform miracles. And, and they surveyed believers and non-believers, so it wasn't like, well, that's easy, because they were all Christians. 79% believe the miracles in the Bible actually took place. 63% know someone who claims to have experienced a miracle. 48% say they have experienced or witnessed one. 90% of Christians believe in miracles. 46% of non-Christians believe in miracles. 67% of Americans have prayed for a miracle. 
and 77% believe miracles can cure people that have been given no chance by medical, direct, medical doctors. So today we turn our attention to another important fact about miracles, and that is that they never go unnoticed. And I'd like to share a story with you, and I've been given permission by Julie a couple weeks ago to do this, about a miracle that I experienced that didn't go unnoticed. And it happened to be the day when, when Hutch died and went to be with Jesus. And as he sat in his hospital bed, and we were all around him, and we were praying and laughing, and we were reading scripture, Hutch laid in his bed, and he continued to look up into the corner of his room. And I initially thought, well, maybe TV was on. And I looked up, and TV wasn't on. But he continued to look up into that corner. So then I thought, well, maybe, just maybe, he somehow sees his reflection or the reflection of the people in the room. So again, I kept looking up there, and there was no reflection that he could see. And then it dawned on him. He wasn't seeing TV. He wasn't seeing a reflection. He was seeing Jesus. Now, I chose not to say anything to Hutch because I really wanted to know. Because I didn't know where everybody else in the room stood. And I honestly didn't want to freak anybody out. But as we walked out of that room, I told Julie, Julie, Hutch saw Jesus in there. Now, I noticed that miracle. But what was amazing was that I wasn't the only one. A couple weeks later, when Julie was talking to her son, Jeff, Jeff said the same exact thing. He said, Mom, Dad kept looking up in the corner of the room. Mom, Dad saw Jesus. You see, I believe that a miracle happened that day. And I'm proud to say that it didn't go unnoticed. So last week we began this sermon by examining the miracle of having good, godly friends in our life. But today we look at part two of that sermon by looking at the impact that this miracle had on a king. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for today, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for the miracles that you, you show us each and every day. Lord, we thank you for the miracles that we see. And, and Lord, we, we thank you for the miracles that we don't see. Lord, as we come before you today, Lord, let us lay down our burdens. Let us lay down our worries and our fears. Lord, if there's sin in our life that is preventing us from knowing you, Lord, let us lay it down at your cross. Lord, I pray that this message would be anointed with your word. Let it touch us. Let it teach us. Let it heal us. In Jesus' glorious and mighty name we pray. Amen. So we're beginning back again in verse 14. And starting at verse 14 it says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you on this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the old image which you have set up. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, just to kind of give you a little refresher, you know, some, some people went and told on, on these three. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying anything, but these three guys didn't, didn't do what you were told to do. 
And so King Nebuchadnezzar brings them there, and he's giving them, like, he really doesn't want to burn. He likes these guys, but more importantly, he wants to save face in front of everybody else. He made a decree, and heaven forbid, if people start disobeying the king. So he's like, look, just, just do it once, and you won't burn up. Do you really think that your God can deliver you from my hand? And they say, oh, you know, remember the church commercial, silly little rabbit. <laughs> Do you not think that our God will deliver you, us from your hands? You see, church, there are some things in life that are just plain wrong. It doesn't matter who may be for them. They are still wrong. And we need to make up our minds that we will take a stand against that which is wrong and take a stand for that which is right. God's call for each and every one of us in our lives is that we take a stand for what is right. I'm sure you remember the old saying, two wrongs don't make a right. Well, we have to remember that just because someone else does something, it doesn't mean that we need to follow. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see, we all are going to have King Nebuchadnezzar's in our lives. People will always try to force us to worship their idols. And if they don't, they will try to convince us with the threats of a furnace. And when that moment comes, you must ask yourself, in whom will you trust? In whom will you trust? Yes, as we learned last week, it is good, it is comforting to have good godly friends that will stand by us. But will you trust in the empty threats and promises of those around you? Or will you trust in the promise of protection and provision by the Lord? God wants us to be faithful, and God wants us to be fearless. Church, we have no reason or need to back away from who we are. We have no reason to be ashamed of who we belong to. We have no reason to be ashamed of what we believe in. As Paul wrote in first, uh, with first Romans, first Romans, Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. You know, I've done a weekend with, with both of our sons called Passport to Purity, which is through family life. And one of the key concepts that they teach during those weekends is you must make a decision now what you will do before the situation occurs. And, and that has to do a lot with dating and relationships and this and that. But, but they ask the kids, the boys, before you go on that date, decide what you're going to do. Before you go to the party and someone asks you to have a drink, decide what you're going to do. See, church, we must decide ahead of time where we are going to take a stand and where our boundaries are. Because if we don't, it'll be too late. We must already know what we're going to do if someone asks us to bow down and worship their false god. We must know already what we're going to do if someone asks us to worship a false idol. So we can't wait until that time. Because unfortunately, if we do, history has shown that we will make bad decisions. But if we know where our boundaries are, if we know where we will draw the line in the sand, we will be able to stand up with courage and confidence in our God. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were people just like you and me. They had hopes and they had dreams of their future. They wanted to live, and I can promise you, they definitely didn't want to die. But they were faced with a difficult choice. Were they going to bow down to an image, or were they going to be burned alive? 
Those three men took a stand that day for the Lord because they knew that the Lord was standing for them that day. Church, here's what we need to get a hold of. If we're going to live for Jesus, then we're going to face furnaces. There will be furnaces of criticism, furnaces of intimidation, furnaces of hatred, furnaces of temptation, furnaces of trials like you cannot even imagine. And church, just because we are saved and living for Jesus, it doesn't mean that we have a guarantee that we will be protected from trouble. In fact, the opposite is true. Look at what the world did to Paul, who was persecuted and imprisoned multiple times. Look at what the world did to John the Baptist when he was beheaded. Look at what the world did to Jesus when he was crucified. If the world treated the greatest of men this way, why do we think that they would treat us any differently? Yes, the Bible does promise persecution for each and every one of us if we choose to live differently and determine for Jesus. But more importantly, the Bible also promises us that we will never be alone. Church, we have to know right now that we are all going to go through fiery furnaces. But the question is, who and what are we going to choose to go through them with? Who and what are we going to choose to put our trust in? Continuing in verse 19, Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression of his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it is usually heated. And I've heard researchers said that the degrees that they heated it to was really hot. Come on, that was fun, right? And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and other garments and were cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? The answerman said to the king, True, O king, look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Instead of three men, Nebuchadnezzar sees four men loosed inside the fire. And he says, the fourth is like the Son of God. And it dawns on the king at that moment that there is a God who could and did deliver those three men out of his hands. See, church, when you're in the midst of fiery trials, God is there. When you're in pain and suffering in a hospital bed, God is there. When you are betrayed and all alone, God is there. In fact, church, it's safe to say that God is with us when others aren't. God is with us when others aren't. Yes, God may let us pass through fires, but can you, you can rest on his promise that when you find yourself in a fire, Jesus is right there with you. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew wrote in Matthew 28, 20, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Here's the point, church. God may let us go through fires, but I promise you, He will never let us go through those fires alone. He will be with you when you enter into it. And he will be with you as he takes you out of it. I think it's ironic that King Nebuchadnezzar heated the fire seven times more, hotter, to prove a point. 
And through that point, God was able to bring more glory to himself. King Nebuchadnezzar intended to bring attention to himself. But in the process, he brought more attention to God. King Nebuchadnezzar intended to make their deaths more gruesome. God intended to make their deliverance more glorious. Genesis 50, 20 says, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. You see, I'm sure everybody at that time, when they saw them cast into that fire, they expected that they would hear yelling and screaming, that there would be nothing left of their body. Even their bones would just become dust. But the Bible tells us that there was no hurt. There was no screaming. There was no yelling. They felt no pain or uneasiness, at least. The flame did not scorch them. The smoke did not stifle them. They were alive and well as ever in the midst of that flame. That's why in Isaiah 43, 2, it says, When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Because during our fiery trials of life, God is with us. And when you feel and sense the flames rising all around you, when you feel like the heat is beginning to get you, church, remember to open your eyes. And when you, when you do, you will see that he is right there with you. Fiery trials will not harm us. But just maybe those fiery trials will burn away the things in our life that are preventing us from knowing Jesus. He allowed them to go through the fire, but he did not allow the fire to go through them. And I want you to start thinking about a church as you sit in the furnace and as you feel the flames around you. I want you to challenge to begin thinking that that just might be the safest place to be. Now you're crazy, like, what? Why would it be safe to be inside of the fire? Well, if I'm inside of my fire, then my enemies can't get me, right? If I'm inside of my fire, then sin can't touch me, right? True, but here's the key. If I'm inside of my fire, then Jesus is right next to me. And I don't know about you, but whether I'm in a fire or I'm not in a fire, the best thing that can happen for me is to have Jesus right next side of me. See, we shouldn't pray to avoid the fires. Here's what I think. I think we should pray that in the fires, we grow closer to him. God stands ready, willing, and able to meet us in the furnaces. The church, are we ready, willing, and able to meet him there? I don't think as Christians we should live a life trying to avoid the fires. I think as Christians we're called to live a life where we walk through the fires. Continuing in verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. And they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss 
against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. You know, I think, how ironic is verse 30, right? Most people will go along with everybody else because they want to have some type of favor or blessing. But yet it was because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not go along with the king, they actually got a promotion. Why? Because their disobedience was to a king, but not to the king. Their favor did not come from a king, but their favor came from the king of kings. But I want to go back up to verse 24 for a second, because in verse 24 is the key to this message. Verse 24 says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. See, church, King Nebuchadnezzar got it right. And it's the lesson that we all need to learn. Miracles never go unnoticed. Miracles never go unnoticed. Jane, guys, if you want to come on up. But here's the key to all miracles. The key to all miracles is being able to see God inside of them. See, I think sometimes we don't catch what happened in verse 24 and verse 25. It says, we don't read that King Nebuchadnezzar was amazed that the three were not burned and that they were still alive. The first words out of his mouth, we read that he was amazed that they were not alone. Before he acknowledged the fact that they had not burned, he acknowledges the fact there were four people inside the fire. See, the first thing he said, the first thing he saw was God standing in the fire with them. And then he made a proclamation that it was because God was in there with them, they had not been harmed or burned. King Nebuchadnezzar got it right. And that's what we must do, church. King Nebuchadnezzar was able to see God inside of that miracle. Church, we must never fail to see God inside of our miracles. And isn't it ironic, after they survived and after he brought them out of the fire, he makes a proclamation. He promotes them. But he didn't promote them because they had done anything. He made the proclamation and he promoted them because of God. Through that proclamation, through that promotion, he honored God because he knew that it was God and only God that could have made that miracle happen. Church, that's what God wants out of every miracle no matter how big, no matter how small. He wants us and everybody around us to see Him inside of our miracles. He wants us and everyone around us to know that our miracles are only because of His power. That day, everybody there came to a better understanding of who God was and what God could do. In the end, they all learned that God was greater than the king, greater than the furnace, greater than their false idols. God used that terrible moment in the lives of those three Hebrew men to touch the hard heart of a king. Church, when you're sitting in the fire, you 
you have no idea what God is doing to the people around you. It may be that God is using those moments in your life, those moments that hurt so much, to show the lost world that He is God and only He can help them. Acts 4.16 says, For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. It's interesting, the term the Most High occurs 13 times in the book of Daniel. In fact, it occurs more than every other book in the Bible except for, except for the book of Psalms. And of those 13 occurrences that it occurs in the book of Daniel, over half of those occurrences pertain to King Nebuchadnezzar. That was a remarkable admission by the king that day. Up to then, he believed that his false gods, his false idols were superior to God. But even he knew his false gods and his false idols could not deliver anybody alive from a furnace. When he threw those three men into the fire, only three men went into the furnace. But yet when the king looked, he saw four. And as he called them out again, out, what happened? Well, I believe it's a reminder to all of us that the reason why four men did not walk out of the fire, the fiery furnace that day, is because there's one man still waiting in there for us. So church, when we go through our fires, when the world places us into the furnaces, we can take comfort and know that God is already there waiting for us. He will be the one to greet us in our fires. He will be the one to protect us in our fires. He will be the one to bring us out of our fires. And along the way, as people are sitting and watching, see, everybody expected something to happen that day. But God had different plans. When you sit in your fires, quite honestly, people expect certain things to happen. Those friends actually want certain things to happen. But never forget that God always, always, always has other plans. When God heals, God heals. When God saves, God saves. When God protects, God protects. When God provides, God provides. Church, we can take comfort in knowing that we are all going to go through fires. We can take comfort in knowing that He will be there with us. We can take comfort in knowing that lives will be touched and changed because of it. 
Church, we can take comfort in knowing that with each fire we pass through, we will be better because of it. See, I kind of like that, that last verse, verse 30. And as you go through your fires, read 24 through 30. But 30 is exciting me. Here's why. Because they went through the fire, they got promoted. And I believe, to be honest with you, as we go through our fires, we get a little bit of a promotion as well. See, if we stand firm and as we dance inside the furnace, God is saying, well done, good and faithful servant. So we thank God for the good times, amen? But church, I think it's time we start thanking God for the fires. I think it's time we start thanking God for the lives like King Nebuchadnezzar that will be touched. I think it's time we start thanking God for, for the people that will be changed and healed. I think it's time we start thanking God for the way He protects us. Most importantly, I think it's time we start thanking God for the way He changes us. I'll stand and worship, Lord. We just thank you for being with us through the fire, Lord. Lord, that you break our chains. We are no longer bound, Lord. We are free to serve you with our whole heart. Let's sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me, I once, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Say, twas grace, twas grace that taught my heart to hear, and grace my peace really how precious, how precious is that grace of me, the hour I first believe. My chains are gone, my chains are gone, and I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed. Soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But 
God who called me here below will be forever mine. Here we go. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbid to shine. But God who called me here below forever mine will be forever mine you are forever you are forever mine my chain my chain tied God down in sin Lord, 
Let's worship and bow down. And if you can, just bow down before the Lord where you are. Bow down and worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He
invite uh, Keith to come up for a moment. Because uh, as, as we were singing, Keith felt uh, he got a word from the Lord. So. All right, those of you that know me know I'm uh, pretty shy guy. I'm not really uh, too comfortable being up here, but um, I'm trying to be more obedient when the Holy Spirit speaks to me. Um, so before the service started, God just really put it on my heart that there was like four or five people in the service today that really needed some prayer. Um, I just felt like a really heavy heart, so I feel like there's people here that have a heavy heart, um, just feeling oppressed, um, financial, marital problems. Um, normally we have Craig and Lily here to pray with people, but they're not here today. But uh, Kevin will be up in the front, and uh, Dave will be in the back, and I'll also go in the back. And uh, please just don't leave today without getting some prayer. If you need prayer, I encourage you to get some prayer, you know, today and this week. But uh, I just really feel that there's four or five people that can just really need some prayer. Amen, and it's okay if we end up with 10 people back there too. So uh, Janine will be back there as well, and, and some of the other people in the church, you know, if uh, you want to go back and lift people up in prayer, um, you know, that's what it's, what it's all about. We come to church broken, we come to church lost, we come to church confused. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, He heals us teaches us and he saves us so don't miss out on that amazing opportunity church make sure you know that as you go through your fires he will be there with you and when you come out you will be better because of him so Lord we thank you for today Heavenly Father Lord we thank you for our fires we thank you for the trials Lord Lord, we thank you that the way that you use those to reach people and draw us closer to you. Lord, I pray that we never look at our fires in fear, but that we go forward with boldness and confidence. Lord, I pray that we never run away from our fires, but we enter into our fires like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, dancing and worshiping. Lord, use us, use our situations, use our trials, use our persecutions, use our fires, Lord, for your will, for your purpose. Lord, I pray that with each miracle you do, that we would see. Lord, I pray that with each miracle you do, others around us will see you as well. Jesus, glorious and awesome, miraculous name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. If you need prayer, actually, if we do not move, do not move. Josh and Allison, can you come up for a second? I didn't see you guys earlier. That's why I didn't know. As I said, we're going to have some cake at, afterwards for Josh and Allison's uh, wedding, and um, I just would like to bring them up here and pray for them. And, uh, Church, if you just want to lift your hands up and, and uh, you know, I, I, I hope we all pray for all of our marriages every day. Because now more than ever, marriages are under attack. And I think we need to be strong, strong with each other and strong with those around us. So let us pray for them. How long have you guys been married now? <laughs> month and a half? Well, the honeymoon's over, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Lord, we just thank you for Josh and Alice and Heaven. Lord, I thank for their, I thank you for their, their, their hearts. I thank you for their desire and commitment to follow you, to honor you, Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you for the way that, that through their dating and their marriage, you have been glorified, Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you for blessing this church with them, with their passion and their love for the youth, and their passion and love for you and their passion and love for each other. Lord, I pray a covering upon their marriage, upon their household. I pray that you would just continue to rise them up and use them in mighty and powerful ways. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, now you guys can have the cake. But uh, as we said, if you need prayer, I will be up here. We will have others in the back. Please do not miss out on this opportunity. 
Thank you guys so much. Don't forget about Saturday. If you want to be baptized or want to know more about it, please come talk to me. I'm excited about that. God bless you guys. Have a great week. And remember, do not run from your furnaces. Run through them and praise God while doing it. We hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a four-square Christian church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626-914-3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.